Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Conley. I'm the State Soybean and Small Grain Specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And today I'm here representing our Science for Success team to discuss when early planting doesn't work out. Do I replant, repair plant, or leave this pitiful stand alone? Uh, just as a little background, our Science for Success team is a conglomeration of over 20 land-grant institutions across the United States with over 26 PI or faculty involved. So the goal of our Science for Success team is very similar to that of CPN, to be able to develop uh, national, regional, and state recommendations and best management practices. And in our case, it's targeted on, on soybean. So I think the first thing, as we all kind of understand this, based on this title, is what basically at what plant stand do we need to consider action? And there are lots of different tools out there to be able to really assess what a plant stand is. Um, we can go back to our traditional hula hoop method when we we're at drill beans. Now most farmers are in some type of a row system, either 15 or 30 or 22 inch, depending on where you are across the United States. So there's other tools you can do, utilize as well. Uh, one example here is our bean cam. It's an app you can download that allows you to go out and take pictures from your Android or Apple platform or many of us have now been able to implement such tools as drones just to get us an assessment across the acreage of basically what our plant stand is. And then it really helps us make this decision. In general, coming from this larger group of our Science for Success team, we've kind of characterized it out into a north versus a south distribution. So if you're in the southern regions, and by the southern regions, I would basically mean below I-70, <clears throat> would be the Mid-South, the South, the Mid-Atlantic. We're looking at roughly somewhere with a plant stand less than 50 to 60,000 regions. They're relatively evenly distributed on a per acre basis. Now, as you move further north into Illinois, parts of Wisconsin, specifically as we get into you know northern Minnesota and North Dakota, we're looking at a little bit of a higher uh, replant decision threshold, which is roughly at that 70,000 plant stand. So again, most of you have some local considerations, but these are generally the rule of thumbs that we use across the country for our Science for Success team. Now, obviously, whenever you have issues with a reduced stand, part of it is we have these different patterns because not generally are they uniform uh, low stand across the entire feed, field. So what we do is we consider an action threshold. If a stand loss pattern uh, that leaves areas of more than six to 10 square feet in size is without any plants. So that's kind of a, an automatic threshold in order to make some decisions. Now, if they're less than that six feet, many soybeans that are grown today uh, have the capacity to put on three times as many seeds or pods on, on their tillers than our grandfathers or our fathers beans that we planted 30, you know, 30 years ago. So today's modern genetics, especially when we're pushing farmers to plant early, allows us a little bit more grace in terms of having that action threshold of when we need to make a corrective plan for fixing that um, plant stand. Now, <clears throat> when we look, try to make that decision between replanting uh, the entire field, which is starting over, or repair planting, there are like six important considerations that we'll walk through. And these are the plant's ability to recover, what the calendar date is, your weed management plan for your field or your area, what is your seed availability, what is the cost of replant versus what is your insurance cover, as well as yield penalty. So we're gonna, we're gonna walk through each one of these individually and kind of discuss them uh, at, from a point to point basis. First thing we have to understand is, you know, what is that existing plant's ability to recover growth? First of all, we have to understand the, how this plant grows and develops and at what point we have plant death. So if you look here, this is an example of a VC soybean where we have the unifoliate leaves are, are emerged and open. If we see damage above our cotyledons here, we generally don't see any type of a yield penalty in an early planted situation. And that early planted situation obviously differs if you're in um, North Dakota versus if you're in Arkansas or Louisiana. But just as a frame of reference, we have any type of uh, stemmed injury or loss above our cotyledons, we usually have a pretty 
good chance of 100% yield recovery. Now, if we lose one of our cotyledons, let's say through something such as soil crusting um, or some type of wildlife or insect damage, or we have broken plants just from mechanical damage, we lose one of our cotyledons and we still just have one cotyledon left, we can see regrowth and pretty minimal yield loss. And that minimal yield loss is anywhere from like zero to 4%, again, based on when you plant and uh, where you are in the country. Now, remember, one of the critical things to see is if we lose our apical marrow stem here, or we lose any of the stem above our cotyledons, we still have two axillary marrow stems at each one of our one at each cotyledon that we were able to regrow. And that's generally when we would see some type of a wildlife injury where a deer, for example, will come in and basically munch off this, this top part of that plant. And we will get um, regrowth from each one of these apical meristems. And eventually one of those apical meristems will get dominant growth and will continue to grow as normal. Another problem that we have been dealing with um, for a a long time and more so readily with the advent of some of the extend products out there is chemical drift and generally when our plants are this small uh, they can recover from most chemical drifts the obvious one that we would not have a lot of recovery from would be if it was a non-glyphosate tolerant soybean and glyphosate drifted into here and then at that point we would kill the entire plant so basically what we're trying to say is that in these early stages the soybean plant has a pretty substantial ability to recover and have pretty minimal yield loss moving forward, assuming that we have don't have any injury below our cotyledons, because obviously that is where our growing points are. And if we have injury below our cotyledons, then that plant is dead, and then we don't really put that into our assessment for our plant stand. The next characteristic we use is obviously calendar date, and that changes from the northern part of the country all the way down to the south and mid-south. But generally the north central region where we grow roughly 80% of U.S. soybeans, we see a pretty substantial and significant yield penalty by delayed planting past that frost injury date. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So example, we will just use this 3R because it's easy to recognize up here in North Dakota. And what we see is basically past April 25th, we lose roughly 2.8 bushels per acre per week we delay planting. So when it comes to making replant decisions, this is one of the things we need to understand is should we leave an existing stand alone that may have 50,000, 60,000 plants, or if we don't just leave it alone, we plant into it, it's much more useful for farmers to leave that existing stand, even if it's light, because of the yield potential on those plants are much greater than if you went in and replanted 10 days later or two weeks later based on availability of seed and when you get into that field to make that replant decision. So that's an important characteristic when it comes to making that decision if you tear that field up or, or and start over from scratch or you plant into an existing stand. And in most cases, across the country, we would just recommend that farmers offset their planter and plant into an existing stand so that we can utilize and capture that high yield potential from those early planted soybeans, even though that stand may be minimal uh, or light. Obviously with the advent of Roundup Ready or glyphosate resistant weeds and other herbicide resistant weeds, weed management situations is a critical key in terms of making this decision to either replant or um, basically fill in, if you will, or repair plant. One of the things we've noticed is that when we have these thin stands, you know, less than 75,000 in the north, less than 50,000 in the south, we will see delayed uh, canopy uh, coverage, which would delay that timing where we can have that plant uh, competition for the soybean plant out competing those weeds. Generally what we've seen, and I'll use Wisconsin for an example, because I've done the most work here, is that even at 50,000 plants per acre, if we have a, a normal growing season in terms of temperature and precipitation, even in stands that light, we still will get 100% canopy closure, but that canopy closure is delayed roughly seven to 10 days. So in that situation, I remind farmers to really be pretty aggressive in laying, layering in 
your residual herbicide program in order to um, <clears throat> manage weeds, specifically in the north where we're dealing with water hemp, in the south where you're dealing with more with palmer amaranth in order to keep those weeds at bay and small until we can reach that canopy closure. Uh, one of the things we have noticed, like in the south and parts of, uh, say, Nebraska, where fields are irrigated, we do have lower irrigation efficiency uh, when we have a thinner stand because we don't have that canopy closure. So in terms of the overall economics of the system, <clears throat> that might be something that might trigger farmers in an irrigated area to maybe make that decision at a higher threshold than farmers that don't have the capacity to irrigate just based on uh, the, uh, the efficiency of irrigation and how that might impact that overall productivity of that stand. Obviously seed availability and variety availability is a big choice and decision for farmers. I think one of the things we need to consider is, are you dealing with a free or reduced cost replant situation and how long before you can get that new seed? Uh, and for that matter, can you get seed? I know a lot of times in the seed industry marketplace, uh, the seed industry is moving seed around and just based on farmers wanting the newest genetics, highest yield potential, you may not be able to get that same variety. So you may have to make some decisions of replacing that existing variety with a different variety. Can you get access to it? How soon can it get to your farm? And then do you need to adjust the maturity for an even harvest? And what we've basically found in the North, and again, I'll speak from my experience in Wisconsin, for every week delay in planting, there's like a two to three day delay at maturity and harvest. So most farmers make that decision uh, to replant roughly at that VC growth stage, um, which would be that unifoliate time frame. So what that would mean is most of the time those plants are going to be somewhere between seven and 10 days difference in terms of when uh, they will um, mature at harvest time. So again, depending on where you are in the country in the north, it's probably not as big of an issue as in the south where you're dealing with hurricanes and other uh, problems is trying to get the crop harvested in a timely manner and have higher seed quality. So some things you can do is adjust that maturity group for an even harvest, but we don't really stress farmers go too crazy with that. Maybe go a half a maturity group earlier, but for the most part, if you stick with a very similar maturity group being, just know when that seven to 10 day gap up front, you're gonna be dealing with a two to four day difference in evening out that maturity. So I think for the most part, most fields that's tolerable for farmers across the country. And this goes without saying, but I think you just have to be pretty careful and confirm the herbicide traits match <clears throat> what you are able to go out there. Like don't put it in a, in a list in A3 bean and drill that into or plant that into an existing extend flex field. Obviously when you make a post emergence herbicide application with either product, you're gonna kill the other one out. And also watch those pre-herbicide -herb, pre labels will allow you to be able to actually plant into an existing stamp. So as we always tell farmers, read and follow the, the labels in order to make sure we're all kosher in terms of making sure that we're not causing more problems or losing more money by misapplying or um, misplanting into a, an area that it just doesn't fit. Uh, number five, it's the cost replant and crop insurance. Um, most farmers due to the programs that we are um, allotted to, do carry some form of industry replant coverage um, through the RMA or other crop insurance properties. Make sure you understand the rules and regulations regarding your specific crop insurance. And I think it's pretty clear to farmers that they have to understand the real cost of replanting. By that, I mean, just because you get free seed doesn't necessarily mean that replant or um, fill in um, is free. What I mean by that is, it still costs fuel to get across those parts of the field. It still costs someone's time. Uh, the labor costs are still there. It also costs wear and tear on equipment. So there are other things to understand that that replant or that fill-in uh, repair plant, whatever you might call it, isn't necessarily free. Okay. And I think it's always clear that you have to understand that we really push farmers to pay attention 
what their RMA replant coverage date is. And this is the new map that we uh, worked with RMA last year to develop, just to make sure that you do have coverage for those dates. And those dates align across most of the United States compared to where our yield loss penalties kick in. So I think we've got some really good alignment now uh, in today's map for crop insurance versus what that map looked like even a couple of years ago. And lastly, this is always important, understand what that yield penalty trade-off is because most farmers are out there, if they have a significant event, it may, in terms of frost or some uh, other flooding event, you're impacting both your corn and your soybean fields. And you have to make sure you understand where to prioritizing your replanting in, in your corn versus your soybean field in order to maximize that entire productivity of your entire farm operation. And what I mean by that, and this is just an example of one field in southern Wisconsin that we see here, the, the relative yield of a percent maximum. We see the yield penalty drop off really quick for soybean, but it's a relatively even slope. With corn, we have a little bit more of a, a flat slope until we get roughly the 120th day of the year, which is roughly around May 20th here in Wisconsin. Then that slope kicks in. So what this basically tells us is if we we're out there planting in early April, we go see we have some stand related issues. Uh, the priority would be to fill in and fix your soybean ones first because you have more time than you do with corn. But once you get past, let's say that May 20th, then you need to do a better job of priority, prioritizing that corn replant if, if necessary. Now, <clears throat> as we step back, I think there's a couple of things we need to think about in terms of those um, social costs that we all deal with in the farming operation, okay? So what is the cost of a farmer doing nothing? Which means you should have done, you should have won out there, you should have repaired plant, uh, but you didn't. Uh, so what is the cost of doing nothing, okay? I think for most of us, our standard advice is you wait the seven to 10 days before making that decision. And that's really hard for farmers to uh, wait that long. They wanna make a decision, especially if there's some crusting, they see some broken necks and we automatically, our eyes are trained to go to the worst parts of the field. So that is a, you know, that's one thing we usually overestimate what the bad parts of the field are, okay? Because it's our human nature, we wanna fix it now, okay? But I think it's really key that when we're in these thresholds, again, that's 50 to 60,000 in the South, around 75,000 in the North, that we really have to understand and balance the economics is like, you know, Say you're in, in the Mid-South and you're staying at 70,000, the economics would tell you not to go and make that decision. However, the, we run into these external challenges such as the cafe talk or land contract pressure um, that we have in different parts of the country. So there are some external externalities that come into play that again, we try to push the economics, but also just being able to make sure the farmers are, can remain and, and to be able to get access to that land on a continual basis and not lose it just because of what someone may see just driving by and thinking you are not a good farmer where in fact you are and you're following the, the, you know, the balanced economic plan of what our recommendations would be. So we do know this is a complex issue. The other flip side is what are the cost of doing something when you should have done nothing, okay? And again, this gets into labor, equipment, and input costs that are increased. I mentioned this earlier, earlier that even a free replant costs farmer money. We always, always, always encourage farmers that if you do go through and you do fill in um, an, an existing stand, that we leave a check strip or two or three across that field to verify that decision. So this can inform you and your crop consultant and the seeds person that you're working with if this happens again next year or two years down the road. So a lot of times when I ask farmers, all right, just leave a couple swaths widths out there and nine times out of 10, the decision should have been not to do anything because the stand from going in and filling in or repair planting another 60 to 100,000 plants into a stand, the yield is, if not the same, minimally greater than those check strips where farmers left that they should have, that they didn't replant and didn't do anything in. And basically that comes down to a loss of, of economics for that field and for that farming operation. 
So in summary here, I think what we really are trying to emphasize is we try to get farmers to repair plant. Very rarely do we want a farmer to go out and tear up a whole field and start all from scratch, uh, mainly because those existing plants that you got out there have a significantly higher yield potential. Remember the North Dakota example we used, you're almost at three bushels per acre per week yield penalty by delaying. So if you are out there 10 days later, two weeks later, the plants that you re repair plant in are automatically out of the gun going to be four to six bushels less yield potential just based on land or based on planting date. So we prefer farmers to repair plant. Um, next, as we discussed today, know that minimal stand necessary to in your region. Um, again, this is a national effort from Science for Success. We know that there might be some differences based on soil type or geographical areas at that. Those numbers at 50, 60,000 in the south, 75,000 in the north may differ, but I think that's a good place to start with. And lastly, we always try to get farmers to prioritize profitability. Obviously, that the, the name of this game is it to, in order to maximize profitability, in order to be able to keep farming that land, not just next year, but in, in, you know, in continuation, just to make sure we can maybe be as profitable as possible. Now, if you like more information on this topic, feel free to uh, take your phone out and scan this QR code in the bottom right-hand corner. This will be able to send you to our publication and a whole fact sheet that we go a little bit deeper into the discussion than we did on this, on this slide summary today. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank our Science for Success team. Uh, this is, again, that group of 20 land-grant institutions uh, that are primarily focused on soybean and 26 PIs from across not just the Midwest, but the major soybean growing areas of the country, which would I think we calculated as roughly 92% of all U.S. soybeans are covered by our Science for Success team. And I also want to give out a big shout out to uh, CPN, the Crop Protection Network, for hosting us today and inviting our Science for Success team to come and talk about replant decisions in soybeans. If you have any other questions, uh, feel, feel free to find us on the web for Science for Success. Or if you have specific questions for me, feel free to uh, reach out at Twitter. I'm at BadgerBean or Google me at uh, www.coolbean.info. Thank you for your time and happy planting.